Today I'm going to be sharing with you my 9-step UX research process and I learned how to do my UX research from my first design mentor whose background is in UX research and innovation and he drilled in a lot of the design processes um, into me so that I can really understand the why uh, for each step of the UX design process in general and the UX research phase was no exception. <laughs> So with that said, um, I built a lot of confidence in the UX research phase and I think my confidence eventually grew as I also shared my UX research process with my teammates for the two teams that I created for my case studies. To explain my 9-step UX research process, I'm going to use one of my case studies as an example and the one I chose was the Crunchyroll one. Yeah. Now, because I want to make this video as concise as possible, I'm going to just briefly explain each step of the process. And so I'm not gonna dive too much into them. And with that, the goal of the video is to help you get a better understanding of what the UX research process is like as a whole package. And to just simply showcase how I do UX research for anyone who's interested. My 9-step UX research process starts from creating a research plan and working towards to creating a user persona. I also prepared a notion board which is what I used to organize the entire project's timeline and I will link it down in the description box below so that as you watch this video you can follow along with me and because I'm going to be looking at it too like I have my laptop right here in front of me so that I make sure I don't miss out anything while I'm explaining this to you. So we're gonna look at this together. And then let me kind of just explain real quick about how I organize my Notion board. From the start, I just have the actual title of what the deliverable is, along with um, how long projected time that we would finish a deliverable versus the actual time finishing it. And then we have um, all of the other extra stuff on the far right as well. So all the files, links, is in there for reference too. If you feel like you need an example, then feel free to look at mine. If it wasn't clear already, anything that I am going over today is going to be on my Notion board. So any of the forms I created, for example, the research plan or the interview guide, um, you can literally just look at it for reference. And for each step, I'm gonna briefly explain why each step is important and how I did it. So if you're already on my Notion board, then you can see that at the top, I have a deliverable titled research plan. And uh, the research plan, the reason why we create this is to basically create a guide for us of how we're gonna approach our research. Before we actually execute um, any part of our research, we create a research plan. If you look at my actual form in the attachment section all the way on the right, then you will notice that I included goals and assumptions in my research plan. and. I learned that it's really important to include both sections in your research plan because it's important to also be able to refer back to it once you finished with your um, user interviews and empathy mapping validate any of the assumptions that you had and check off all of the goals that you created for yourself so that you know that you marked off all of the goals that you were aiming for in the research plan i always include what my methodologies are for research and it's usually both secondary and primary secondary meaning um, any information or data that's already available for you for free whether it fits through Google, books, articles, etc. Secondary research is basically market research and competitive analysis. And then primary research are more like user interviews. Primary research is gathering new data to understand who your users are by using forms of one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, group interviews, or surveys. It's more of just like directly communicating um, and listening about the user's experience yourself. Basically any data you can find to support your design decisions and argument as to why you um, designed its context for whatever you're designing for. Yeah, 
Market research is the second process of the research phase. Now once we've fledged out our research plan, we can head straight into the first part of research. I always start with market research just because the data is already available for you. And for me, my experience with research is I usually gravitate towards like free, anything that can I can get for free. And so it's a lot of Googling because there's so many things available already for you. Um, like other people already done all this research for you and it's available, so why not, right? I target towards doing market research first because of that since it's more approachable and easy and can get it out of the way. <laughs> Another part of secondary research is the competitive analysis, which is the third step of my nine step process. Categorized within the secondary research section. And why we do a competitive analysis is to identify who our competitors are and to uncover their strengths and weaknesses on their websites while also identifying common design patterns as well. When I did this, um, I also learned something new, which is doing a SWOT analysis from my second mentor for this particular case study. Previously, when I did my competitive analysis, I only included strengths and weaknesses of each company that I believe is a good competitor for the product I'm designing for. Now with SWOT analysis, like don't worry, I, I wasn't really sure either because my first time hearing it, but it stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The reason why she wanted me to do a SWOT analysis was because due to social current events and how people's lives have been drastically changed due to the pandemic, it's best to analyze the threats and opportunities to help you craft a more coherent and successful competitive analysis. And the word successful here means that you can use more than 80% of your collected data for your project. And if you feel like the data you collected for your threats and opportunities don't feel um, as useful, then you can argue that you don't need them. Now the fourth step is provisional personas. We create user personas to understand who our potential users are, aka um, who to ask questions for interviews. Who you believe is our best candidate for interviews. How you create your provisional personas is by looking back on your other research that you've done for marketing and competitive analysis that you just did. And so you can tell that with the research process, everything just kind of connects together and that's when the magic's starting to happen and you're gonna find out that you're gonna have a really cool user persona at the end. And after you did all that initial research, you can finally start interviewing people. <laughs> Yay! Just like how we did a research plan, we also create user interview guide. The interview guide that I made for was aimed towards users who use the Crunchyroll app. The reason why we create an interview guide is to prepare a script for asking questions that will help our research. And how I created this was focusing on using open-ended questions. We're trying to create um, a report with these users or these participants who are volunteering to be a part of your research. And so with that said, I tried to just really imagine the scenario while I'm creating my interview guide. But just imagining how the interview process is going to be like, I also reorder the questions so that the actual interview can be more, a little bit more of like a seamless or more natural flow. Um, so thinking like, okay, maybe this question can go first and then this question can be last. And and the main takeaway, for, in my opinion, with an interview guide is that um, just be flexible with it. You don't have to be militant about it and follow word for word of like how you laid it out. You're trying to make your interviewee as comfortable as possible so that they can share more of their insights and experiences about the product or about a similar experience. They can just comfortably share their story and you can collect as much data as possible. And the only way you can collect a lot of data is to make sure your interviewees are as comfortable to share. One tip I wanted to also mention was that when you're asking interviews, asking them for any of their hard data like their age, name, occupation, etc. like those kind of demographics, it's best based on my experiences to save them at the end after you answered all of their questions. Especially if it's something like revealing someone's age, some people might be a little sensitive about it. The idea is that by the time you finished all the questions with your participant, um, by then you would have built some kind of like 
a connection with them and they'd feel a lot more comfortable to share whatever else you want to know about them by the end of the interview. The sixth step is actually doing the user interviews. Gather qualitative data and identify our users' insights and needs. And in my team for this project, I have three designers. Each designer tried to recruit two people for a total of six participants. And we tried to recruit users based off of our provisional personas, since it reflects back to all the research and data we accumulated. When we conducted interviews, we used Zoom, thanks to COVID. So whoever that designer recruited, that person will be responsible for leading that interview and then one other person, another designer, would be in the behind the scenes taking notes as the interview goes. And so we've had situations where one designer out of the three of us couldn't make it. Um, and so in that case, it worked out even then to, to just have two people attend all of our interviews. <laughs> Once we finished our interviews, now that it's time to really dive into our research findings. So after the interview, we uploaded all of our recordings that we had permissions for and we uploaded them on our Notion board within each file that we built for each participant. We all went back to the person that we were responsible for taking notes for and just rewatched the videos and took additional notes and kind of really assessed for any of the user behaviors that our participant was making during the time that we couldn't really focus on while we were doing the interview because sometimes some people talk really fast or maybe we missed something. So this process is just making sure that we're not missing anything. We're almost there, we have two more <laughs> steps to go. We're on our eighth one, and the eighth one is the empathy map. The reason why we create an empathy map is to find observational empathy points from our participants. Also, identifying common patterns is important as well that we will find out in our empathy map too. Based on these patterns, we are able to garner our insights and needs, identify our users' goals, needs, motivations, frustration. My empathy map is a little different. <laughs> I learned it a little differently than the conventional way of how I've seen other designers have done it. I have seen other designers um, use the concept of like feel, think, see, do. I actually don't um, separate the categories like that. How I do it is a little different where it's very similar to like affinity mapping where I flood the entire wall with post-its color coordinating all of the participants. The idea is to put all of my interview observational notes on post-its and identify common patterns. Common patterns by first I look at one participant and I look for common patterns with this participant and etc. for all of the other participants. I use these patterns to develop my goals and insights. Let me again refer back to my Notion board. On my Notion board, under Empathy Map, I have a link to Miro. So this is a collaborative project and we use Miro to do empathy mapping, um, site mapping, and affinity mapping. And I actually included all of that on this one pager. But I'm just going to talk about the empathy mapping because this is only for the UX research phase. So I conducted the workshop with my teammates to do this empathy map on Miro. We split off the work by creating observational notes on post-its for the participants and then regrouped all of these common patterns by creating bigger categories. And these categories identify just kind of like a general scope of what all of these insights mean to us. And once we finished creating these categories, we decided to create an emoji chart. An emoji chart is basically just for us to see um, how many users uh, fit this insight. The, collected all of the post-its to each insight and then we counted how many users fit that particular insight and we ranked them. Um, and so in our mirror board, if you see our emoji key, we have our heart that represents most of our users behind this particular insight to a star and then a whatever emoji face and then an angry emoji face to represent um, our user's least common insight. And after we had created all of the categories and um, organized all the emojis, we gather the emojis and we just group them all together. And so you see this like huge list that I outlined or 
I created an outline shadow for to identify our users' goals, needs, motivations, frustrations. Finally, we're on our last one! The reason why we create user personas is pretty obvious. I mean, this is like the whole reason why we do the entire research. Basically create a potential user of the product we're designing for, right? And in this case, for this project, it was the app. And how to create your user persona is to reflect back on all of your user data that you collected to refer back to your empathy map a lot and that's the reason why you want to make sure that everything in your empathy map is reflected back to your um, research finding notes and all of your user interviews you gather all of your user data by reflecting back on your empathy maps users insights and needs you can also look back onto your research finding notes that you took from your user interviews because basically your user persona is reflecting to the entire uh, data that your participants have shared. You just have to remember that every single information that you include in your user persona has to reflect back to research. If someone asks you like where did you get this part of the personality or etc then you have to make sure that you can actually pinpoint where you got that information from. I hope that you found this research helpful and I'll see you next time. Bye! Is you trying to date me? Is it yes? Is it no? Is it maybe?